Welcome to Club Book with Julie Otsuka. I'm Patty Kamea. I'm a historian based in the Twin Cities. I write about Japanese and Japanese American history, among other things. Uh, before I introduce tonight's guest, I'd like to take a moment to tell you a bit about the series that brings her here today. Club Book is a program of MELSA, the Metropolitan Library Service Agency, made possible through Minnesota's Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and coordinated by Library Strategies, part of the Friends of the St. Paul Public Library. Ramsey County Library is the co-organizer of this evening's talk. Thanks also to partnering bookseller, Red Balloon Bookshop. A purchase link to the swimmers will be available in the comments section of this live stream feed. Uh, have it shipped, pick it up at their store in St. Paul or have them deliver it personally to your door if you're in the area. Last, um, a quick shout out and lasting gra gratitude to Joan Trigg and Janet Carlson, who provided invaluable help in honing the promotional materials for this special program. Uh, one final housekeeping note, also in the comments, you'll see a survey link. Melsa would love to hear what you think of this club book program, and it's very quick and easy. Okay, so for a featured event, novelist Julie Otsuka is the daughter of a Japanese immigrant father and Nisei Japanese American mother. She's a poignant chronicler of the Japanese American experience across the first half of the 20th century. Her breakout debut, When the Emperor Was Divine from 2003, shines light on California's dehumanizing con concentration camps for Japanese Americans. It's an often overlooked chapter of American history. Uh, when the Emperor Was Divine holds distinction as one of the most popular community reads titles in the country, and more than 45 colleges and universities have assigned it as required reading for incoming freshmen. Otsuka's follow up, The Buddha in the Attic from 2012, breathes life into the untold story of Japanese pictured brides in the early 1900s. It earned a Penn Faulkner Award and put Otsuka in contention for the National Book Award and has since been translated into more than 20 languages. So her latest novel, which we'll be talking about tonight, The Swimmers, revisits the theme of American concentration camps, this time through the fractured lenses of retrospection and memory lost. Um, Bookless raves, once again, Otsuka has created an elegiac, devastating masterpiece. So first we'll have Julie read a, for us a bit. Um, I've prepared some questions to kick off our conversation and then we'll have time for audience Q&A. So please drop your questions in the comments thread here um, on Facebook and our tech manager will route them to me. Uh, if you'd like to contribute a question more anonymously, you can send a private message to Book Club here on Facebook or send an email to clubbookmn at gmail.com. Okay, so um, hi, Julie, can you start us off by reading a bit from The Swimmers? Sure. Um, I'm just going to read from the very, very beginning of the novel, um, from the very first chapter. Um, which is set in an underground pool, and it's called the underground pool. The pool is located deep underground in a large cavernous chamber, many feet beneath the streets of our town. Some of us come here because we are injured and need to heal. We suffer from bad backs, fallen arches, shattered dreams, broken hearts, anxiety, melancholia, anhedonia, the usual above ground afflictions. Others of us are employed at the college nearby and prefer to take our lunch breaks down below in the waters, far away from the harsh glares of our colleagues and screens. Some of us come here to escape, if only for an hour, our disappointing marriages on land. Many of us live in the neighborhood and simply love to swim. One of us, Alice, a retired lab technician now in the early stages of dementia comes here because she always has. And even though she may not remember the combination to her locker, 
or where she put her towel. The moment she slips into the water, she knows what to do. Her stroke is long and fluid. Her kick is strong, her mind clear. Up there, she says, I'm just another little old lady, but down here at the pool, I'm myself. Most days at the pool, we are able to leave our troubles on land behind. Failed painters become elegant breaststrokers. Untenured professors slice shark-like through the water with breathtaking speed. The newly divorced HR manager grabs a faded red styrofoam board and kicks with impunity. The downsized ad man floats otter-like on his back as he stares up at the clouds on the painted pale blue ceiling thinking for the first time all day long of nothing, let it go. Worriers stop worrying, bereaved widows cease to grieve, out of work actors unable to get traction above ground glide effortlessly down the fast lane in their element, at last I've arrived. And for a brief interlude, we are at home in the world. Bad moods lift, ticks disappear, memories reawaken, migraines dissolve, and slowly, slowly the chatter in our minds begins to subside as stroke after stroke, length after length, we swim. And when we are finished with our laps, we hoist ourselves up out of the pool, dripping and refreshed, our equilibrium restored, ready to face another day on land. Thank you so much. Yeah, I love that opening. Um, it's so beautifully painted. You feel, um, you feel like you're in another world, the transformations, the magic of that pool. Um, so yeah, actually, I think I'll start with a question that was inspired by an audience member's uh, pre-submitted question. I tweaked it a little bit, um, but I felt like as a reader, um, your use of the first pl person plural felt very different between Buddha in the attic and the swimmers. Um, with Buddha in the attic, the book about the picture brides, I felt the weight of ancestors speaking to me from the grave, you know, their struggles and suffering, their laughter and small joys. Um, but the mood felt very different for me reading the swimmers. Um, yeah, it was magical. Uh, it, it almost was like listening to a school of fish. Uh, so, so yeah, how, how did it feel to write in the first person, uh, plural, in Buddha in the attic versus the swimmer? Um, did it feel different or um, it, if it all, and if so, how did your feeling of writing in the first person, plural, change between the two works? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, I love, I love writing in the first person plural. It's very, um, even though Buddha in the Attic is very much in a minor key, it's a very kind of expansive, almost joyous voice. Um, but I think that, you know, I started out writing humor before I ever started writing serious historical fiction. And I feel like I always tamp that down um, while I was writing my first two novels. And I, I feel like I let the humor come more to the surface. Um, so I felt a little bit more like myself um, when I was writing The Swimmers than when I was writing The Buddha in the Attic, which was based on a lot of historical research. Um, and like you said, just the, the weight of history um, really hangs over that novel very strongly. And with The Swimmers, it's, um, even though it's dealing with some difficult subjects, I wanted it to be more buoyant, just a little lighter in tone. Um, and um, and I, I wanted the humor to be there as well. Um, but it, but they are very similar voices. Um, it's, it's just a great voice to use whenever you're talking about a large group of people. As a follow-up question, um, so you mentioned uh, researching for Buddha in the attic. Um, you know, I, I could almost smell the newspapers or whatever you were looking through um, as I read through the Buddha in the attic. So did you do, um, what kind of research did you do to um, create the collective voice of the swimmers? I relied more, I think, on my own life experience. I was a recreational swimmer for years. So um, I was just really struck by the community of regulars at my, at my neighborhood pool and just how people had formed these bonds. Some of them had known each other for you know, more than 20 years. And 
just the experience of being in the locker room, just being in a very, you know, gender only space is very unusual, I think, in life. And, um, and I read a lot about the business of nursing homes for the second home, uh, second, second half of the novel. Um, But I also, again, relied on my own experience of having, you know, watched my own mother's decline from dementia. Um, And I did do some general research about Alzheimer's um and some very very gentle research about swimming but i had to do i mean each sentence in buddha in the attic is based on an an historical you know piece of information so it took a long time to put that book together but this book was it was it was really not you know it was it was a little easier to write i think than the first book although this book took me longer than the first novel for whatever than the second novel for whatever reason yeah um well, I, I have a question about that, but we'll we'll get to that one later. So, yeah, um, I yeah, I so I get the sense that you you um, had so much material, um, and as a reader, I appreciate your very spare prose. You know, you don't rely on blow by blow accounts. You know, this happened and then this happened. Um, you don't really tell us how to feel. Um, with the narratives that focus on what happened. Um, And in the swimmers, except for the chapter on the crack, that seemed to be a progressing crack. Um, Mm -hmm. The, in the other chapters, it seems like the happening, you know, the event, like um, the onset of dementia, that seems to be the starting point. And then you give just enough to convey how the characters feel. and you just have a wonderful hodgepodge of bright images from the past and present coming to together in an intuitive way. Um, you know, especially, let's see, yeah, you know, for the chapter you're describing the swimmers, and then um, you know, um, Diem Perditi, you know, just so many different memories just hodgepodging together. Um, but when you step back, you get a sense of the big picture, kind of like looking at a pointillism painting. Maybe someone else made that point too. Um, But anyway, can you tell us a bit about what that process looks like for you to just have this huge hodgepodge and then just melt it down to, you know, some very, um, very smooth sculpture? Um, you know, do you have this gigantic word document of 10,000 words and shrink it down to a thousand word paragraph? I, um, I do, I take a lot of notes, usually when I'm beginning a novel. So I have these um, Claire Fontaine notebooks, large notebooks with, you know, with graph lines on them. So I can write really small and put a lot onto each page. Um, so I collect data and I don't know if you can see in the background, but I, you know, I have a lot of stuff on my walls Uh um so I I just I'm kind of like a magpie I think in the beginning I just collect as much information as I can and I probably use maybe I don't know 1.75 percent of what I the information that I gather um but what you said about painting I mean that my training you know in college was in the arts so I started out as a figurative sculptor and then as a painter and I always think about when I'm you know, when I was in the studio, when I was working on a canvas, I would just, you know, you don't want to focus on a detail in the corner and at the expense of everything else. So you just kind of want to sketch out the scene very loosely and then just bring up the details simultaneously. And that's kind of what I try to do with each paragraph. I'll just sketch out a paragraph loosely and then just kind of bring the whole thing into focus. I don't always write chronologically. So I'll, I'll write the scenes as they come to me. So I'll write kind of whatever feels hot you know, in the moment, what I'm emotionally connected to. And then I'll often go back later and try to find the right order for the scenes. Um, just, you know, it's all about, you know, alignment or this goes here, no, it goes here. And just finding, you know, fooling around with different co- configurations and seeing you know, which, which, which configurations work the best for the story that I'm trying to tell. So it's a lot of hit or miss um, in the beginning. So you're describing a kind of painter um process but it's also kind of a collage isn't it yes definitely I feel like a collagist um, yeah. because especially with Diem Perditi I mean when I was writing that I literally had each sentence I just wrote as a line you know across the page so they were kind of like sticks you know and I, I would order them this way and that way and I bundle them over here and over there and um 
So, but uh, yeah, I, I am kind of a collector of images, I think. That, that, that sounds like a fun process. I mean, it, it, it's probably very frustrating at times, but, but yeah, it, I like the idea of you know, creating collages out of ideas. Yeah, I mean, it can be frustrating when things don't come together, um, but I think, I guess for myself, I really trust my intuition and my unconscious to kind of guide me as I'm going along. Great. Yeah, so um, speaking, so you mentioned that um, it took longer to create um, the swimmers. I'm wondering if part of the reason might be um, might relate to a point that came up with your interview with Terry Gross for Fresh Air. Um, you discussed a break between the chapters about the swimmers and the crack and on the one hand and then Diem Perditi as a pivot point. Um, so, so yeah, what, was, was that part of the reason why it was difficult to put it together or? Um, I had these two things that I wanted to write about swimming and then, uh, you know, this woman's decline from dementia. I wasn't, I wasn't sure how to connect them initially um, um, or even what the story would be. So I didn't really have a clear idea when I was setting out, especially when I was writing the first chapter of the summer is the underground pool. I didn't even know what the next chapter would be. So I, I felt like I was almost kind of working in the dark. I was just writing these kind of chapters as they came to me. Um, and it took me a long time to figure out what would come after Diem Perditi. Um, I know I wanted, you know, I knew I wanted to write about a nursing home, but I didn't, I couldn't figure out the right point of view for a long time, the right voice to tell that chapter with. Um, and, you know, once I have the voice, then I, you know, I'm off and running, but it took me a long, I think I, I, I tried writing that chapter many different ways and the last yeah. chapter as well. Um, I think I tried to write the last chapter from, first person and then the the nurse the Bella Vista chapter you know I tried I it, until I came up with the voice of a slightly evil malign home yeah I I love that that was I did. Just, yeah <laughs> it was actually really I, I'd never written from the voice of the cruel oppressor before mm. it was actually it was actually a lot of fun um and um, once I you know thought of the first line you were here because you failed the test I, I, you know, then I could finally begin to write that, that chapter. Oh, I loved it. Yeah, so, um, yeah, speaking about the Bella Vista chapter, um, you know, so yeah, I, I felt like the finished product, um, the different chapters mirror one another in subtle and perhaps not so subtle ways. And I felt like there was a particularly a striking contrast between communities that comes together in the swimmers. Um, so on the one hand, um, there is Bella Vista, this memory care facility where there's all these rules um, that the residents may or may not be buying into. But then the pool also has its sets of rules and, you know, people swimming in their own lane, so to speak. Um, but then th there's a big elephant overhanging it all, the prison camp, where, where there are, you know, even more rules. Um, and yeah, you know, in some ways, so all three communities, the pool, Bella Vista, and the prison camp, you know, um, they're, they all have different um, kinds of voluntary and involuntary aspects to them. Um, so, and I think in all three, um, it matters less who you are on the outside, but what you are when you are inside those communities. Um, so I, I'm curious, um, yeah, how did you first envision the relationship between these spaces, both written and unwritten? Um, and did that understanding change over the course of your writing? It's, you're the first person that's mentioned the prison camps, which is, you know, I think it's a really astute observation. Uh, I didn't, you know, I wasn't thinking of them initially, but when I started writing the Bella Vista chapter, I thought, well, this 
is a lot like the place where the Alice character was when she was young. You know, it's, it's she's she's forced into this environment that she doesn't want to be in, and there are rules that she has to follow. So it's a place about which you know, she has no choice whether or not to be there. Um, and and the pool is kind of the opposite. I mean, it, it's a place even though there are rigid lanes and rigid rules. It is a place of great freedom as long as you do this same thing over and over again, which is swimming. Um, you're only do, you're only there to do that one thing. But um, but I wanted to really contrast just the freedom and and the sheer joy of just being a pure physical body in the water. Um, you know, with what it's like to be a pure physical physical aging body. You know that that's 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 older and that doesn't have you know, you just don't have as much control over yourself and your body um, when you when you are aging. Um, and so the world suddenly becomes a very, very different place in which, you know, I think just joy, taking joy and being in the body is not really, it's not really there in the nursing home chapter at all. And then of course, not at all in the prison camp. Um, but, you know, when I was writing my first novel, When the Emperor Was Divine, I still, especially from the chapter that's told from the point of view of the boy, I still wanted there to be these moments of kind of joy, um, you know, bright spots within that kind of very desolate, desolate landscape. And I think the same is true with Bella Vista as well. I didn't want it just to be, right. you know, utterly unrelentingly grim. Yeah. Okay. yeah, I thought it was so moving how, you know, um, the, the imaginary um, administrator or salesperson or something says, well, you can imagine, you know, the landscape outside your mother's home. And I just said, oh my goodness. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, yeah. Let's see. Um, I, let's see. Yeah, uh, another um, connection I kind of saw was that, you know, the, the pool was, the pool was a place of joy and community, but, um, and, you know, everybody was okay as long as they were staying in their same lane. But at the same time, this community is so fragile. You know, it literally started to come apart when cracks started to show. And um, I also felt that there was a tie in with, you know, ordinary life for, um, Japanese Americans or any other group of people who suddenly it's over your time's up you got to go to jail don't pass go don't collect two hundred dollars yeah you're also the first person to make that comparison but I was I was definitely thinking I mean I I think I just noticed at one point gee I, I seem to be writing about again and again these worlds that are set up that are not always idyllic but you know they're the Japanese Americans had their own communities you know and they were doing all right um, before the war, they'd struggle a lot. And then suddenly just things are all, a sign goes up and you're told to go, you, you know, you must go away. Um, so I seem to be telling that story over and over again, just to, you know, kind of in different, you know, in different ways. And I feel like with the swimmers, I, I, I did repeat that, but I didn't realize while I was writing the crack chapter that I was kind of retelling that same story of a, you know, of a community that suddenly just forced to um, disband. Um, let's see. So, uh, well, can you talk a little bit more about community trauma? Um, I guess that's a big topic, but um, I guess on the one hand, uh, you know, Japanese Americans, from, from a certain viewpoint, um, someone might say, well, Japanese Americans got reparations um, and on such and such a date. Um, you know, everything should be good. Why should, you know, why, why tell these stories? Um, I guess that's, that's a starting point. Yeah, I mean, I think, I, I guess I was very aware while I was writing this novel um, of this last generation to have been in the camps very quickly leaving us, you know, every day more and more dying. And there are just so few people left who were actually witnesses to that time. Um, so, you know, Alice is one of those last people, you know, who was there as a child. Um, and I feel like, you know, with her death, 
disappears a whole world, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I think each person is, carries the memories of that time with them in their own ways. Some people are, were very, very traumatized and others um, were able to move on afterwards um, and, you know, lead, if not for themselves, at least they were able to see their children be fairly successful lives and take a lot of pride in that. Um, but I, I, you know, I feel like, you know, for Japanese Americans, there's always a before and after. Um, and I guess, you know, the crack too, there's, it's, it's a before and an after, it's the beginning of the end. And, and, you know, in a way being sent away to the camps was the beginning of, it was the beginning of the end of one life. Um, and then afterwards was the start of, of a whole other life that was just very, very difficult, I think. Yeah. Um... Yeah, I, I like your point about, you know, with with the death of each person who witnessed this, there disappears a whole world. Um, and also a way of understanding your current world, right? I mean, reparations are one thing, but um, one thing I love about the swimmers is that you tackle the question of historical and social amnesia. What does it mean to carry a community trauma in a world where everyone else is just swimming along? Right. And then um, I like how you portray through the relationship with the daughter and also the husband who's from Japan, you know, um, how this trauma kind of affects your relationships and it affects um, it, it. I guess what I'm trying to get at is even if you you yourself did not experience the camps, this camps, um, the continuing community trauma, it affects your relationships and it, it does affect your, um, your world in ways that you don't quite realize. Um, you know, just, just as a side note, my own family did not go to camp, um, to the camps because they were on Hawaiian sugarcane plantations. So, um, you know, I was raised to believe that the camps were someone else's story, mm. but over the years, I've concluded that the social ecosystem that created those camps, um, it still lives on in different forms today. Um, and by forgetting and thinking it's someone else's story. Yeah, um, I think you just froze up. Um, you know, I've been talking about the camps and my mother's experience in the camps for years and when I first started traveling and speaking about my first novel I was always surprised at the students who really you know didn't know very much about the camps at all and you think that you know now 20 something years later that would not be the case but I'm still I, I feel like nothing's I, I still feel very surprised at how many students don't know at all about what happened during World War II the Japanese Americans yeah so there, there is definitely this historical amnesia um and I don't necessarily know what you know, how to remedy that, you know, except for, you know, my small way to write my books, but in a bigger way, I, I don't really know. I mean, education, obviously, but there's so many rules, as you know, now with what you can teach and cannot teach and ban books and so forth. Right. But it's very, very frustrating. Um, yeah, yeah thanks. I guess my Zoom connection <laughs> um, kind of, kind of uh, gave out a wit bit, but um, so, uh, your point was that as you go around and talk about your book that, you know, um, you were saying that this, you're surprised with how many students don't know. Still after story. 20 yeah. years. Yeah. I thought, yeah. I thought in the beginning, oh, this will change. This will be different 10 years from now, but it's really not even that different 20 years from then, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, I, I guess it's hard to know why this amnesia persi persists. Um, Perhaps it's because um, it's not convenient to remember these things, or I don't know. It's, I mean, it's certainly not pleasant and it really, you know, it kind of goes against the idea of American, the progress of American history. Um, right. And it's just a very, you know, it's, a, it's definitely, a, you know, it's a dark spot in our history that, you know, nobody takes any pride in. Yeah, uh, that is true. Let's see. Um, I wanted to, okay, to make sure I saw everyone's questions. Um, let's see, maybe it, 
I had another question um, kind of related to amnesia, but uh, in one of your interviews, it came up that your US and UK editors discourage you from expressing the anger in the final chapter of when the emperor was divine. Um, if, if I'm understanding um, the what I remember correctly, correct. yeah. but, but you prevailed and readers overall responded positively. Um, that that's what I recall from reading. No, that's exactly right. Okay. And I was, I yeah. mean, I was, I just felt like it wouldn't have been my book without that last angry chapter mm -hmm. there. Um, yeah. It would have been a very, very, it would have been a, without that last chapter, it would have been a very kind of beautiful, pretty book. <laughs> but yeah. Well, yeah. What, what, what would the point have been, you know? I mean, the, right. um, so, um, and I do get more comments about that last chapter than about any other chapter in the novel. And I'm so glad that I, that I left it in. So sometimes yeah. you just know when to push back and stand your ground, but it's hard sometimes, especially that was my first novel, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but, um, but I'm glad that I left it there. Yeah, yeah, me too. Um, so I had a follow-up question that was back in 2003, before the pandemic, before George Floyd um, and the Atlanta spa shootings. Um, so I was curious to know, um, in our current context, you know, um, almost 20 years later, do you feel that our society is more receptive to Asian American anger? Um, and if so, how might that affect what you write in the future? No, I, well, especially now, I don't feel like it's really safe to be angry at all, you know? Um, um, although there are many more Asian American writers who are writing now, which is wonderful. Um, but I feel like it's, you know, it's, it's just not a safe time to be an Asian American, you know? I mean, I, I, you know, I don't take the subway. I'm very, I'm just careful about being in New York City in a way that I never was. And I've been riding the subway for 30 years, you know, but I just, I don't feel like, you know, if somebody says something to me on the street, I don't feel like it's necessarily safe to push back with anger. Um, so um, so I, I feel like it's actually an especially dangerous time to, to show anger if you're Asian American. So, so are you saying then that it's um, less safe to express anger now than back in 2003? or maybe it's just changed? Well, I think in 2003, it was right after 9-11, so it was probably it, not safe to express anger if you were Muslim American, um, yeah. you know, just like the focus is on a different group every time there's, there's some sort of, you know, attack or event such as a pandemic. Um, some group is always, you know, to blame. Right. Um, there's a finger that's always pointed. Um, so right now, the, you know, the finger happens to be pointed at us again. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I don't want all the questions to be dark and depressing. <laughs> so um, here's, here's a fun reader question. Mm -hmm. um, so one reader mentioned uh, the recent film, Still Alice. I didn't see it, but I saw the trailer and um, it, it's about a woman who experienced early Onset, um, early onset Alzheimer's. Um, so their question was, you know, I can so easily see your Alice's story come to life on the screen. Um, is this something you'd consider? Uh, and have there been any talks of adapting any of your three beautiful books for the screen? No, no uh, movie interest at all. Um, I, I think my my novels aren't really plot driven enough to, to you know, to make for, because the screenplay is a very tight construct. It's got a beginning, uh -huh. a middle and an end, but, um, but The Boot in the Attic was actually, um, was made as a play in, in Paris um, in 2019. And I don't speak French, but I went over to watch it and it was just visually, it was just ravishing. It was just gorgeous. Um, so um, that was a real, treat to see, you know, just it was complete transform, you know, it's just to see a transformation of your work and to see it become something new, um, you know, on the stage was just, it was just utterly thrilling and chilling. Were, were you able to read an English translation of the script? 
No, and I didn't really need to. It was very, very visual, um, okay. which I loved. Um, and you know, and I guess since I since I wrote the book, I, I you know I kind of knew what was going on. <laughs> it, was great. it might it might have been harder for somebody else who didn't speak French, who didn't write the book or hadn't read it, to follow the the play. But um, but it was very. But again, it was the visuals that really led me through the story on the stage. Okay, so that really did happen because I think there's a reference to the narrator's um, uh, book being turned into a play in France, I great. think. And it, it really did happen. Wow, that's great. Congratulations. Oh, thanks. Thank that's you. That's very exciting. Thank you. Let's see, um, we've got another pre-submitted question. Um, so this reader writes, I'm a caregiver for a parent living with Alzheimer's and found your depictions of Pick's disease. Um, and what it does to families, both moving and correct. Um, would you be willing to share a bit about your own experiences with dementia related illnesses and what parts of Alice's story were you especially keen to render the right way? Oh, that's a big question. I mean, both of my parents uh, had dementia. So my, my father just regular Alzheimer's, you know, and my mother had Pick's disease, um, which usually manifests much earlier, um, you know, when people are in their forties, fifties, sometimes even thirties, um, but it's, it's very different in that the initial uh, symptoms are not, have nothing to do with memory loss. It's more with personality changes, um, sometimes quite radical, um, which can be very, very jarring. Um, and also just a, kind of general dis, dis inhibition. Um, and so I think with Alice, I wanted, I wanted to show in the beginning, especially that her memories were still very, of, of her younger years were still very clear and intact, um, which is what allowed me to bring up some of her camp memories, you know, to the fore um, in those latter chapters. Um, yeah, but they're, yeah, but they're, they're, you know, they're, they start out very differently, but I think the end is kind of the same for both of those, mm. you know, you do end up with kind of ultimately um, just a kind of blankness towards the end. Okay. Let's see. Um, okay. I, um, one question from Facebook. Um, I described part of your, right, um, I describe parts of your writing as a poetic list, which I haven't read anything like it before. Is the style new to you or something taught in writing programs? Your way with words is stunning. I agree. <laughs> Thank you. You know, I wasn't even aware of being a list maker, but I, you know, mm -hmm. but I, I know that, that you know, that's been pointed out in several reviews. So I don't know how I arrived at, you know, at doing that. It was never, no, it was, it was never taught. And I, some, if I don't teach, but if I were to teach, I would never teach someone to, to make lists and call that a paragraph. But I, I guess it's something that I do. I just collect, I don't know, I collect information and I, and I put it together. And I rely also when I'm putting things together, well, on a, a few things on, but a lot is just has to do with sound, the sound of the language and the words um, and where the rhythms fall. And the other thing is, you know, visually, you know, I'm kind of painting a picture on the page. So I'm thinking about what things look like in my head. Um, and then I'm also trying to move the story along. So there's, there's plot as well that's driving me. Thanks. Let's see. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, so in, in your lists, uh, I see, especially in the, chapter that focuses on the swimmers, references to current events um, or people's perceptions of the state of the world, like there's, a, you know, the heat domes and climate change or sudden bringing in foreign influences when the crack appears. Um, yeah, and I read in one of your interviews that you wrote most of the swimmers before the start of the pandemic. So, um, I'm curious, to what extent did recent events inside and outside the Japanese American community inform how you wrote those lists or paragraphs, whatever you want to call them? Yeah, I mean, I the only chapter that I wrote 
during the pandemic was that very, very last chapter. Um, and that was also the first chapter that I wrote, not in my neighborhood cafe, which is where I, you know, I usually write. So I wrote that last chapter at home, um, which is a very different experience of writing for me. Um, but, you know, I mean, I know that the crack can now be seen as, you know, it, it can be a metaphor for the pandemic. Um, and so, but I didn't go back and really do any rewriting. Um, and then, you know, there are a lot of weather related details as well, you know, but I, I wanted to kind of set the first, just set the novel in, a, in an unnamed California town that was suffering from, from climate change, um, but mm -hmm. just in a very, very general way. Um, yeah. Um, let's see. So, yeah, so how, how does climate change, or how do you see the climate change as um, tying into to the swimmers? Well, it's very, I mean, whenever they are above ground, I don't know if you noticed this, but the weather is, there's always something heat related going on. It's always, it's just very, oh. very hot. So, okay. it's, so I want to contrast that with this kind of, ideal climate down below. I mean, it's always oh, okay. 81 degrees and then you can go in the water, but it's, it's, you know, it's kind of a, it's a, it's kind of a relief, you know, to be down below where it's just cooler. Um, but whenever you go above ground, there's always, it's just hot, hot, hot. Oh, okay. Okay. I, now that you mention it, oh, okay. That makes sense. So above ground. Uh, yeah, you might not, I mean, it's good that you didn't notice it actually, cause I wanted it to be very subtle. Um, just, there are other things in the book too, that I wanted it to be just very subtle. Like there, I mentioned birds a lot um, and sometimes eggs, but that's the theme, but that's just, you know, also just kind of quietly there. It doesn't really matter if readers notice it or not, because I think that a lot of things register with a reader unconsciously. Actually, can you talk a bit more about birds? Cause you know, the, so the scene kind of, let's see, toward the end, uh, there's the father's story about the bird that, you know, his, its friend would died and then, um, then the grandparent put the mirror up and then the, the bird survived and, you know, and yeah. I, I don't know that something, when I went through this book again, something kind of clicked for me in that little scene, um, you know, it, it, I started paying attention to mirrors like, oh, okay, <laughs> you know, there's, there's mirrors in this story. Um, yeah, can you tell me a bit about that story of the bird in the mirror? Was it a story that you heard in childhood? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a story that my father had told me. Um, okay. So he loved birds as a child in Japan, you know, and he grew up in this tiny village in the mountains and um, I have a picture of him, he's holding a pigeon and he, he you know, he, he's probably like six or seven and he's just so delighted. So he had a lot of homing pigeons, which I think are now extinct. Um, but he would teach them you know, how to return to the roost. Um, and he lost a few along the way. Um, but, um, and he had many different kinds of birds, starlings and this bird that flies up and down in its cage. Um, and it only sings when it goes up and down. Um, but he did tell me this story of, um, the, you know these two birds and they were a pair and and um one of them died and the other bird just became very very well uh, i don't want to ascribe emotions to an animal but but the parent appeared to be very very sad and just stopped eating and then one day uh, my father's mother just hung this little mirror right outside the cage and the bird just you know started chirping again and eating again and this very and became very, very animated so you know and, and i remember when my father told me that i said well did the bird think that, that the person, the bird in the mirror was, you know, its mate or its its own self? I mean, obviously my father didn't know, but it was something that got me thinking. So that's where that anecdote came from. So it actually happened because it almost sounds like a fairy tale. I know it does. Like Aesop's fairy tale, long, long ago, <laughs> far away in Japan, this happened. <laughs> it's upon a time. And then Alice, of course, at a certain point, you know, as with many people who suffer from dementia, you know, she cannot recognize her own face in the mirror, you know, that, that there will come a point when you, when you don't know who you are, when you look in the mirror. Um, yeah, yeah, so it, and it's kind of a mirror to the time 
when um, you know she first met Frank and she forgot her name, right? Right. I, I was a little curious. Um, maybe I'll have to read through it again, but I was curious if the Frank story started coming out after she developed dementia. Was this something she kept as a secret? <laughs> Yeah, no, it's something that she did keep as a secret. I mean, she's got these photos in a drawer for many, many years that she never really talked about. Um, and then because there was this loosening up, right? Right. Um, inhibitions. Um, okay. It is something that she begins dwelling on more. Um, yeah. I was wondering, because, yeah, in, you know, it's like, okay, the story about um, the UTI and sex, that was the first story that she's kept on thinking, oh, okay, so what other stories are popping out now that she's, her personality starting to change? I thought maybe the Frank stories might have fallen in that category, because yeah, it's yeah. not something you want to share. No, no, especially if you're, you know, you're, you're married and your spouse is still with you, you know, yeah. and, and, you know, being very good to you. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's fascinating. Let's see. Um, so I'm curious, uh, let's say that, you know, it's, it's um, I don't know, 40 years from now, 100 years from now, and my niece and nephew's future grandchildren um, are running around and they have a copy of your book. Um, what? Um, what would you like later generations, such as my niece and nephew's future grandchildren, um, to take away from the swimmers, um, perhaps a message about home or um, what to remember, practice about community, um, anything? Just that it's really important that we're with the people that we're with while we're with them. I mean, I think, you know, the daughter in the novel is not really able to make amends with her mother until it's too late, too late. You know, she spends much of her life just pushing the mother away. And I guess it's important to realize that, you know, the people we're with aren't necessarily going to be with us forever. Um, so um, I guess it's not to take time for granted. Yeah, and, you know, I, I think um, one of the themes that you bring up in your book, um, yeah, there, there's so many different versions of swimming in your own lane, right? You're, you're with this community, but you might not necessarily, um, and, and you care, you know, people care for Alice, uh, but you might not necessarily, um, how should I put it? Um, outside the con constructs of that lane, um, you know, you might not envision different ways to care for each other. I'm not sure if I'm making any sense. Uh, but, you know, what, when we're with family, too, it's like, okay, I got to do this, right? I got to do that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think what I wanted to show with the pool chapters was that Alice was actually very, you know, very well I think carried for emotionally in a way by the other, especially the other women mm -hmm. at the pool and in the locker room. And that there was always a place for her and that she was always welcome no matter what she was going through. Um, and so I really wanted to emphasize that sense of community even outside of the lane and outside of the pool, you know. Um, I mean, I guess it would only extend to the locker room because usually outside of the locker room and, and you know, there, there's really very little contact at all among the swimmers. But, um, but just that this is a place where Alice was welcome, you know, by, by her fellow swimmers. Yeah, well, um, I think in your book, you mentioned that um, Mrs. Wong gave her a silk jacket that ended up being garbage. <laughs> I thought, oh, that's interesting. Because it was probably not cheap. A silk. Or, you know, it might have been. <laughs> Oh, okay. It could have been like, you know, but, um, but Alice is, you know, there, I mean, she does have a sense of humor. Um, and there is, I think, a side of her that could also be just a little glib and ruthless as well. She's not terribly sentimental about certain things. Other things she is, like her past love. Yeah. 
Yeah, there, there's there's so much going on in the swimmers. Yeah, just um, another big thing I saw was you know the questions about what you keep and what you throw away. So you know, Alice threw away all these um, all this clothes and stuff, but she kept all that Shiseido makeup. <laughs> At a later date and thinking, okay, you know, um, what is garbage and what is stuff that you keep? And then, um, and then also the scene where um, the narrator finds the letters that her grandmother wanted to burn in the, in the um, wedding veil and the gloves, you know, Th those things were precious. Um, but the grandmother wanted to, um, to Oh wait, was this that was, was this something that happened to you that I read? Yeah. About? Yeah, oh, yeah. I'm sorry. I no, am so okay. sorry. I'm so yeah, sorry. Yeah, no. Okay. I mean, I one thing I wanted to say was that you know, Japanese Americans don't always have a lot of heirlooms and stuff because we threw out so you know so much right after Pearl Harbor was bombed. You know, families just got rid of all of their Japanese stuff. So there wasn't a lot of like literally like physical stuff that was handed down to the next generation. Um, you know, like all the letters from Japan, photographs of you know, Japanese relatives, all that stuff was just thrown out. Um, just so, you know, so it wouldn't be found by the FBI or, you know, during a raid or people couldn't be, you know, so the Japanese Americans wouldn't be accused of being you know, spies. Um, but my, my grandmother did keep these letters that her husband had written to her during the first year of the war from the camps where he had been detained to her and the children and she she went you know we found them just at the very last minute when we were moving her out of her house in berkeley and she had put them in the fireplace and she was going to burn them but you know and that was the first that we'd ever seen of those letters so something that she was keeping very very private for many many years yeah and that speaks again to the community trauma right you know this this is something yeah. that your grandmother chose to um get rid of yet you know when the war was happening, there were probably many treasures that um, people didn't want to get rid of. And and yet they had to, so um, folks who are listening, this is from the book, um, you know, there's the, in the explicit reference to the war, there's, um, there's yeah, the, the inheritance, um, grandmother's Imari dishes, ivory chopsticks, antique woman ta um, wooden tansu, emperor and empress dolls, black and white photographs of your strange kimono wearing relatives. I mean, so these were things that were gotten rid of, not because they wanted to, but because they had to. Right, right. I mean, they had to dispose of so much stuff before they left for the camps, you know? And um, yeah, we actually, we had a, in my house where, you know, where I grew up, we had a, a tonsu, but that was from my father's house in Japan, you know? So he wasn't, you know, he was, during the war he was, living in Japan so that was shipped over years later but that is like one Japanese thing that we have you know but we had very little else you know that was related to the generation before well if that tansu were in Tokyo there's a decent chance that it would have gotten incinerated yeah no anyway. my father yeah he would tell story he lived in this like I said this tiny village outside of Tokyo and he could hear you know the American planes flying over every night towards Tokyo and he you could actually imitate the sound of the you know b29 as it was flying over oh my goodness the village. i mean their village was too small to be a target but um you know he has very 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 vivid memories of that time that that could be another book <laughs> yeah, so, so much <laughs> so much history yeah, so speaking of which um do you feel comfortable talking about your next project um, not quite yet, because I don't okay. know, because just because I don't know what it is yet, it's, and it's very, very early. I'm working on something. I, I don't, I don't really know what it is yet. It's, I, I'm just, I'm in this generative phase. I call it like being in the egg. So it's a very safe space. It's a very womb-like space in my head. Um, but, you know, but I, I'm writing about something because I'm very interested in it, but I, I don't really know. I don't know what it is. Um, I, you know, it's just, you know. I'm writing these scenes as they're coming to me, but I, I don't know ultimately what form I'm going to present them to the world in, you know, I, so it's, so it is a little bit too early. Yeah. Well, your swimmers has been out for less than two months, right? So, yeah, maybe it's a bit early to um, ask about your next project. 
So, um, is there anything else you'd like the world to know about the swimmers? Or question you've been um, dying was there, to. Was there a Facebook question I just saw? Oh, or did it disappear? Let's see. Oh, okay. Um, let's see. Well, the latest, the latest um, Facebook question was, um, can you tell? Can you tell us what projects you're working on currently? And you already went oh, okay. address that. Okay. Um, what are you reading right now and that you would like to recommend to us? Yeah, I just, you know, I just read a book by Jessica Au, AU. She's Australian. And um, it's a book called Cold, Cold Enough for Snow. And it's really hard to describe, it, but it's just gorgeous. It's a very, very short novel. And the narrator takes a trip to Tokyo with her mother, um, who I think from Hong Kong and very, very little happens, but there are a lot of memories attached to the scaffolding of this story, you know, the narrator taking this trip with her mother. And you feel like you sense that there's some sort of trauma, but it's, it's never really um, verbalized. Um, there's a lot that's happening between the mother and daughter emotionally, but it's just unspoken. And um, it, it's, you know, almost nothing seems to happen, but then when you finish the novel, I just was left with a, just a very kind of strong emotion of sorrow. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I didn't know exactly what I was feeling sad about because you can't really put your finger on what it is that's happened, but it, it, that was very, 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 um, it's a very, very moving novel. Um, yeah, and then another book that I read that was completely different was um, Ruman Alam's Leave the World Behind, um, which is, almost like a, it's like it's a psychological apocalyptic thriller um and but psychologically just very very real it's 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 within the realm of the real um and it's just so well done and it's probably one of the scariest books that I've read in a long long time um and so those are I think kind of polar opposites um so I I read kind of I guess eclectically just whatever I feel like reading at the moment but but I, I would really re recommend the Jessica Owl There's a, so since I looked at the Facebook chat, there were a whole bunch of okay. um, questions. Uh -huh. um, let's see, I'm curious to know um, from this list, what was the hardest part of the process with this novel and what was the most joyous? Oh, I think, the, I mean, beginnings are sometimes hard. I, I didn't know, you know, initially when I was writing the underground pool, that it was the beginning of a novel, um, which is actually kind of good because then I wasn't too self-conscious about beginning a new book. Um, so actually the, the swimmer, the swimmer chapters, you know, in the pool were actually pretty joyous chapters to write. I just had a lot of fun with those um, because I never, I think I've been longing to write something set in contemporary times for a long time. Um, and it was, really just kind of fun and a relief to write, you know, about the present, something that was set in the present. Um, and, you know, the chapters that were most difficult were in a way, I mean, the most difficult emotionally were at the same time, the most joyous to write. I think when I was writing mm -hmm. the Impraditi, I remember just feeling almost ecstatic, even that was very painful stuff that I was writing about because I felt you know, it is fiction, but it, it's just based very much on my mother. And I felt so connected to her. And that was when she, I wrote that chapter when she was still alive, but she was, you know, she was leaving us more and more every day. And it was a way of just hanging on to her. So it was very bittersweet, but that was actually, I just remember just kind of just feeling in this very, very emotional state the whole time. And I wrote that very quickly. I, I was working on the Buddha in the attic and I took off a couple months just to write that um, Diem Praditi chapter for selected shorts they wanted to know if I could write a new story and I had this idea that I've been you know thinking about for a long time and so I just finally sat down and wrote it but that was actually just a it was a very emotional experience so it was it was both those things it was both joyous and also very very hard okay thanks um yeah speaking of the Buddha in the attic actually we have a question about Buddha in the attic um so the Writer writes, could you talk about the structure of the chapter first night, written with a paragraph more than three pages long on first read? I found the writing so relentlessly compelling that I didn't even pick up on that stylistic choice. 
Yeah, that is, it's very, very, short. I remember I, I turned it into my agent. I usually show my agent, you know, one chapter at a time. And she waited months for it. And when she first said, she's like, this is it. Cause it's so, so short. It's, it's, you know, it's maybe three pages long, but you know, it's just a compendium of, you know, each sentence is a description of a different way that a young woman can be deflowered. Um, so that, again, it was also, it was very tough. You know, it's just very, very difficult material. Um, and that, I mean, I guess that's the ultimate list, that chapter you could say mm -hmm. in terms of form. Yeah. So um, let's see, what, uh, was there any particular, yeah, D did you let the list kind of tell you how to shape it? Or? I, that, that particular chapter was just very, very intuitive. So yeah, I guess the answer would be yes. I let it, I let the material tell me how to shape it. Um, um, and I, I didn't really have any guiding principle. It was just really about what sounded right. And then when I, you know, when I found the, the right kind of ending, you know, you kind of feel your way to the ending and emotionally it just feels right. Um, but it was, yeah, it was very, very intuitive. Thanks. It looks like we're about at time, but yeah, there, I could, could sit here and ask you all these questions all night. Um, yeah, but they, thanks so much for, for um, taking the time to talk to us. And it's probably a very busy spring. Are you out promoting the swimmers? Um, I know I've, everything I've done has been virtual. So it's oh, okay. Yes, <laughs> just from my apartment. So I'm okay. going to do some events in the fall. Um, okay. In Paris and maybe in Italy because the book will be wow. there. So I'll probably go there if things are okay, COVID wise. So, but I haven't really been out there in real life <laughs> um, for this book yet. So, yeah. Yeah. well, it, it's good to be able to promote the swimmers from from your living room so yeah that's great too but i guess the the problem with zoom though is you can pack more events in a 24 hour <laughs> so so that might require being on for more hours of the day but anyway th thank you so much for taking the time um, to spend thank with you. us and thank you. You, you your questions are so thoughtful so just and your just your reading is yeah your readings of my work just very very thoughtful so just thank you so so much i really enjoyed oh, this. well i no i i enjoyed um reading your book i i feel like yeah um i i'd read so many books about the camps and about you know all, all manner of japanese american history but um you know i i feel like your book is one of the few that really tackles head on you know what do you write about after the camps? Um, you know, what, what happens to the families afterwards? And um, I think you might've mentioned um, in an interview somewhere along the way, you know, um, in some ways what happens after the camps is, is just as tough if not tougher than what happens in the camps. And yeah, I think this is something we, we kind of have to, we have to learn how to deal with. So um, yeah. I, I treasure the time I spent with your book. Thank you. So, um, yeah, thanks. Um, so I have this outro here that I am reading here. So thank you so much for joining us. This has been a virtual presentation of Club Book, a long running literary series of MELSA made possible by the Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. Special thanks again to Ramsey County Library for the part they played in bringing Julie to us. Before you log off, uh, look for the club book survey link, which is in the comments and will be projected in place of my video momentarily. Um, last, please consider joining club book on Thursday, April 14 for an event with best-selling novelist Maggie Shipstead. Her newest great circle intertwines the stories of an aviation daredevil patterned after Amelia Earhart and an, a Hollywood ingenue who attempts to adapt her larger than life story for the big screen a century later. Great Circle is shaped in part by Shipstead's own globe trekking work as a travel writer. This program will be co-hosted by Dakota County Library. They'll be right here on Facebook Live, and as always, it's free. So thank you very much, and have a good night, everybody. <laughs>